All right. Um, hi, guys. Um, I'm here to talk about Component. Um, I'm Tim. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. That's my GitHub address. Uh, that's my email address if you want to send me hate mail. Um, I organize uh, the local JavaScript meetup in Brisbane. Um, I'm organizing a conference called CampJS, which is in um, Australia. Um, it's a camp, like Rails camp, but for JavaScript. Everybody um, hear me? Anybody who has a problem with the volume, put your hand up. Nobody? Good. Okay, so basically what I'm here to do is um, talk to you about my problems. Um, I've, got, I've got a few problems. Uh, I could probably do with a haircut. My mum says so anyway. Um, and uh, I could probably I don't know, do some new shoes. But one of my major problems is uh, with client-side uh, client frameworks. Uh, it's, a, it's a major problem, um, mainly because I feel that they haven't been built in a particularly sustainable way. Um, and one of the main problems with uh, client-side frameworks is vendor lock-in. And so what ends up happening is you, you need to basically, as a developer, you need to pick a team. You need to pick whether you're going to be a JavaScript, uh, a jQuery developer. You're going to be a uh, Moodles developer. You're going to be a Backbone developer. You're going to be an Ember developer. And unfortunately, once you pick one of these teams, you don't have a huge amount of room to move um, outside of that uh, ecosystem. And when you're stuck in this ecosystem, you're kind of like you're at the mercy uh, of that, that code stack to you know, produce the stuff that you need in your application. So um, basically, uh, let me, let me give, give an example. The other day I was trying to build, it was just a plug-in for, um, you know how people have like a menu, and then you scroll, and then the menu thing gets highlighted as you scroll? Um, I mean, I could have used a jQuery plug-in here, but I was like, I don't need all the jQuery. Why do I need all of this stuff? It's like, you know, hundreds of feet of code just for me to, you know, fire an event and have a thing update. It seems like you know, it's completely ludicrous. Um, and so I decided, all right, well, I'm going to try to try to do this without any plugins. This is sort of my first kind of uh, exposure to the component lifestyle. And um, I got into the code, and I thought, OK, well, I need to calculate. So when you've got a thing and you're scrolling, you need to calculate the offset from the top of the page to the element that you're dealing with. Now I thought, OK, well, I don't know anything about how to do that without you know, jQuery. So I thought, OK, well, what I'll do is I'll just grab the piece of jQuery that I need to do this. So I went into the jQuery source and looked at this file. It happened to be called offset.js. And it happened to have all this code in it, which allowed me to calculate offsets, which was kind of cool, uh, useful in its own. Um, but you had to grab that piece of code, that little piece of you know, it was probably this much logic that I needed. Um, you know, in a normal environment, I'd need to pull in all of jQuery to get that. Um, and the other problem was that uh, if I, once I tried to isolate that, it had all these dependencies all through jQuery, which I was then going to have to replicate, um, to figure out what they do, uh, and then pull them into my code base um, just to get this tiny little piece of logic. And what I discovered was I don't need all this code. I don't need all, ha hardly any of this stuff. Um, and I can actually just build this stuff straight on top of the, uh, the browser DOM, like the, the DOM API. Now, this is something I'd never, ever done before. I mean, how many people here have used just, without any libraries, just the browser DOM? Couple. Um, who's only ever used jQuery? Oh, come on, there's got to be more. You're lying. All right, well, I was one of those people, and I'd never really used anything but jQuery. And the whole thing was very confusing, because I was like, oh, I need jQuery. You know, it'll break in another browser. And, but once I went, went into the, um, the code for this offset thing, I discovered that the, all of the code around it was, it was for like, things I didn't care about, like Android and um, you know, IE for Mac. You know, who cares about those things? I don't need that, those, I don't need that logic. Um, so, Anyway, I built this thing, and it worked um, just using you know, the normal DOM. And I felt, oh my god, why have I been using all these libraries for all this long? Um, and it's because of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. 
I sort of felt like, unless I'm using jQuery, my thing's just going to break. Uh, and I feel that a lot of people have this same kind of idea where, um, well, they use jQuery because they know that it's going to work in these other browsers. They know that it's going to work on different platforms. Uh, that's partially true. Um, but what ends up happening is you pull in all this code, which is completely unrelated to your, your, the problem that you're trying to solve. And when you've got like, masses of code in your code base, um, you, you kind of like inherit it. It becomes your baby. And I, I don't really like, um, I mean, I, I know I'm a little bit overweight, but it would be, I don't particularly want, if I have a child, I want them to be nice and thin. You know, uh, to teach them to be trim. Um, and I sort of feel like once we have a, once, when you pull in a piece of code, it becomes your baby then. And you, know, you don't want to be, basically, you don't want to inherit a fat baby. The other issue with dealing with um, uh, these frameworks, which abstract on top of the DOM, is that you end up with all this useless knowledge. Um, it might be useful when you're working with that framework. But outside of that framework, what use is it? I realize that um, all this uh, jQuery knowledge that I've got is completely useless to me as soon as jQuery is out, out of the question. Um, I had no idea what um, you know, document selector, no, document.query selector all was. Who, who's used that? A couple of people. You know, that's the way you get stuff out of your DOM. Uh, and uh, document.query selector all is like, uh, this thing which you will never ever touch if you continue to use um, you know, libraries which abstract away the, you know, the CSS selection process. Um, a good example of useless knowledge, I feel, this is personal opinion, you may, your mileage may vary, is Ember. Uh, as much as I really would love for Ember to be you know, the best framework on the planet, it probably is. But unfortunately, you're, you have to relearn everything you know to, uh, about web development to use it. Um, and I find this, like, it's a really frustrating thing that you have to do where you, if, if you're, you're spending, like, your life being a developer, you don't want to be, like, burning that time uh, on stuff which, as soon as that framework disappears, uh, you know, that, use, that knowledge is useless to you. And I feel that that's the, the problem with um, big, fat, uh, deeply abstracted uh, frameworks like Ember. Uh, Backbone is a little bit better, um, but in, in the fact that it's, you know, it's a small, tight library. But I still think that uh, there's a lot of stuff in, in Backbone which just you often don't need it for the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, another issue that I find with uh, these frameworks uh, is accidental complexity. Um, now, this is something which happens to any application of any significant size is basically you end up with you're trying to build something. And that thing you know, does something which the framework authors didn't originally envision. And what are, you, what are your options there? You can either uh, extend the framework to um, you know, do this new piece of functionality, um, or you can just sort of hack a thing on top, um, or you can build like a modular system if you know how, a modular, how to build like modular stuff on top of the framework is. But most of these frameworks don't actually really give you a huge amount of um, tools to allow you to extend them. Um, it's kind of like, the, the, I feel that a lot of these frameworks are very arrogant in the way that they approach, all right, this is how you need to deal with a problem. And you're going to deal with it in this kind of way. And um, if you've come across a problem which doesn't fit in the, uh, you know, the scope of what we've thought of, it's probably not a good problem to solve. Um, and I, I, I don't think that's good. Um, and like I said, I, every app that I've ever worked on, uh, this is a good one, like Backbone, right? Backbone makes uh, you know, this happy assumption that your um, back end and your front end have like a one-to-one -one, um, relationship with like the data models. And you know, that the, the model that you display on the, the front end is the same, you know, exactly the same representation that you have on the back end. Now, I've never actually had that as a uh, it's never been the case for me. I always end up with, I have to get, you know, to pr produce this, the model that I want to represent on the front end, I have to get mo data from all these different locations. This app that I'm working on at the moment, um, the, the data that I'm getting isn't even, it's not even an, uh, a, a JSON request. I have to pull it out of, it's just attached to the, the body element as a piece of data. Um, now, that's because it's like a, a legacy application that I'm trying to sort of make sexy. 
Um, but Backbone doesn't really give me a huge amount of uh, tools to you know, gather data from all different locations. And so that's a good example of like, I have ended up having to build all this logic to um, kind of like deal with this assumption that Backbone has made. Um, and uh, I sort of feel like the only constant is change. And that's especially true with JavaScript frameworks. Uh, how many new JavaScript frameworks have appeared in the last you know, year? There's been you know, 10. You know, there's Amber, there's Backbone, there's Spine, there's Batman JS, there's Knockout. Which one's good? Uh, and which one has the ecosystem which is going to allow you to uh, you know, take your app to the, to the future? Uh, which one? And the thing is, if you build your entire application on top of one of these frameworks, you're now like, stuck in that framework and that, stuck in that ecosystem. Uh, that's a problem, because you know, in six months' time, that, application, that, that library might not have the support that it does today. It might not have, like the framework author might have moved on. They might have gone to a different company and no longer have the ability to work on their project full time. Uh, things change. And I sort of feel like if you're, if you're building your entire application on top of one of these frameworks, you're investing a huge amount of uh, infrastructure and knowledge and trust in that framework. And I don't trust really anybody. Um, so I, I feel like uh, leverage these frameworks. Don't, le don't lean on them. So if, if your framework is going to be, uh, I like the term invasive framework, where that framework is, it dominates the way that you build your app, and it tries to change the way that you structure your code, I see that as being a problem. Because all of you have come from different back, uh, backgrounds, and you've probably got different ways that you want to build your applications. And the framework should enable you to build it in whichever way that you want to build it. Uh, instead of, you know, yeah, sure, MVC is a cool pattern. And it's uh, you know, separating the uh, business logic from the view logic is awesome. But sometimes it's, it's overkill. A lot of the time, it's overkill. Um, and here comes the big one, is component. And this is the solution. Um, I put in liberate your code. And uh, I think that that's a, a good way to sort of think about um, using components, is suddenly your code becomes free to be no longer you know, constrained to any particular ecosystem or any particular um, development silo. Um, who's heard of components? A couple of people. It's, this is one of the most important things, I feel, uh, on the internet right now. It is so awesome. Uh, and it really changes the way that I've, I've thought about uh, front-end development. It changes everything. Uh, it's driven by a guy called uh, TJ Holowaychuk. Who knows who this guy is? Uh, are you guys just not putting up your hands? You've got some people more. Who's used Express? All right, about four people. All right, so this guy wrote Express. Not only did he write Express, he wrote, oh, well, he's contributed, and I think he had his main contributor to Connect. Who's used Mocha as a testing framework? A couple of people. It is awesome. Forget all the other test frameworks. Use Mocha. Um, he wrote Mocha. He wrote Stylus. Who's used Stylus? Woo! Uh, who's, used J who's used Jade? Cool. These are all written by this one dude. Uh, what else has he done? Um, before uh, Node 0.6, um, there was no clustering solution. Uh, Learn Boost had the clustering solution, and uh, TJ. He contributed to that. I'm pretty sure he wrote it. He wrote CommanderJS. Uh, he wrote Super Agent, uh, Super Test. These are awesome, as well, by the way. Like these, these basically everything I'm listing here is stuff I use on a daily basis. Um, PageJS, Nib, Q, Docs, Git Extras. All this stuff. Like I've discovered that I almost don't have any kind of um, tools in my toolkit that aren't written by this guy. And like what, what I found is I start writing something, and I'm like, oh yeah, I've got this cool idea. And then it turns out he's already written one, and it's better. Um, I don't know what his problem is, like how he does it. It's amazing. Like It, it is amazing. Um, I've got two of the same slide. But what I sort of figure is that this guy's producing an incredible amount of um, you know, high quality open source software. Uh, and how's he doing it? What's his problem? Um, and basically, what he's doing is taking uh, all of his problems and converting them into like uh, pieces which just do one single thing. So rather than solving a problem by you know, 
Like, let's say you've got like an app and it needs to do something. Rather than just like tacking that functionality into your app, um, it sort of seems to me the way he's doing it is like he just builds a module which does it. Um, and that to me uh, seems like a really good way of you know building stuff. Um, like Git extras, anybody use that? It's awesome. Um, anyway, so basically he, he's he's the guy behind components. Um, awesome guy, builds all sorts of awesome stuff. Um, and if there's anything that'll convince you to use component, it should just be like that face, that guy. <laughs> Sorry, uh, it, it is a man crush. Um, so the question is, what is a component? Uh, and the idea is basically you're building small focused modules. I was going to say sm small focused components, but I'm um, saying the word component uh, far too many times. So basically, when you build a component, you're building something which just does a single thing. And the, uh, the idea is not to be leveraging anything like jQuery or Ember or whatever. It's completely independent from any kind of framework, any kind of um, anything. It's just built straight on top of the DOM. Uh, if you have uh, problems with uh, some browser having a problem, you just fix it right then and there in, in the code. Rather than leveraging, rather than having some kind of like abstraction layer, uh, you just fix, fix the code um, when you actually have a problem. So the component itself is just a build tool and a require shim. Now, a second ago, I did just tell you that, like, not to use invasive frameworks. Um, and component is a little bit invasive in the fact that it requires you to write uh, common JS modules. Uh, you guys know what com common JS modules are? Basically, it's the same system. Yeah, you put your hand up. That's good. Um, common JS is the same system that Node uses for um, pulling in its modules. So the idea is that on the client side, now you can just say, you know, require my module, and it'll pull that module in. And you've got the same sort of uh, module.exports um, system. It's, ex it's, ex it's exactly it's modeled off the Node system. And um, I personally feel it's really good. Basically, it'll wrap every single component that you do in a uh, in a closure, uh, and then only expose the interface that you want to expose. And like, yeah, like I said, the I did say, hey, uh, don't use uh, invasive frameworks. And this is a, it does change the way that you write your code, but uh, I sort of feel like it's the minimum viable change that you need to make. Uh, and the thing is, is that they're pulling in modules and things like this into the later versions of uh, Inter uh, Internet Explorer, um, into the later versions of JavaScript. So it's kind of like a, an intermediary so solution. Um, and yeah, the real thing is basically plain.js doesn't f facilitate awesomeness, unfortunately. So you need this require shim to enable the module pattern. Anyway, when I was saying that these things are small focus modules, I'm talking about they are tiny. And when you have really tiny stuff, it makes them incredibly easy to understand, debug, um, or even produce your own version of them. So here's an example of um, a component. This one's called inherit. Uh, that's it. That's the entire component. Now, it doesn't do much. You might be like, oh, well, why use it? I, I can just pull it in myself. But when you're, uh, I can just write that myself. But when you've got like 100 little problems, um, why solve 100 little problems when, um, you know, when there's 328 uh, solutions out there which you can uh, pull into your code and you don't have to write that code. Somebody else is maintaining it. Or not only that, they've got kind of like a, a stub there for you to uh, build upon. So yeah, basically, components. There's 328 already. And this thing's only been going for a couple of weeks, you know, maybe two months. Um, that's incredible, uh, I, I, I think. Uh, that there's so many awesome things in there. Uh, it's written by 50, uh, up to 56 authors. Um, so you know, I've written components. Who's, has anybody written a component? No. I was going to give a t-shirt away to anybody who had. Somebody lie. All right. Um, basically, let's click on this. See how we go. Over that. Oh, mouse. That way. There we go. Click on the button. Cool. So basically, uh, components. Uh, registry is just this wiki page. Um, so as much as I feel, you know, hey, awesome, that Iris, Ca Iris Couch guy, you know, he's spending all this time building all this awesome stuff um, for our NPM. Uh, basically, the way Component deals with that is that they just use uh, GitHub as their infrastructure. So the, the registry is 
you know, just this wiki page. If you want to publish a module, you just add it to this wiki page. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different categories. Um, Ajax, WebSocket, routing, data modeling. There's a whole bunch of UI elements. Um, you'll notice a lot of these are by component. This is also stuff that TJ has written. Uh, I, I assume so. And like, it's amazing. You can build up like almost an entire app just using these pieces. Uh, there's a few that I've done down here somewhere. Uh, yeah, it is awesome. Look at all the stuff that you can pull into your uh, application. Yeah, it makes me excited. Some of these Canvas ones are awesome as well. Like, and in fact, this is what I'm going to talk about next: is this uh, PyCon thing. So, destructuring component. What is it? Um, basically, it's just a uh, kind of like the, the way you build a, a node module. You've got a package JSON, um, but instead of a package JSON, it's called component.json, um, and it contains a whole bunch of different stuff. And I'm going to sort of go through it. Basically, it's got a name. Um, it's got the repo. Um, the cool thing about this is that, like I said, you don't need to publish your repo um, you know, on some infrastructure. Um, GitHub does it. And so uh, everything's namespaced by your GitHub URL. So when I require something, I just require username forward slash repo. So in this case, if I was going to require this particular module, I'd say you know, component forward slash PyCon. Um, contains a description. Um, you list out all of your scripts, uh, everything that you basically, when somebody requires your module, these are the pieces that come with it. Uh, and all of these are listed out explicitly. And the point is, is that if uh, you know, we keep getting requests for people uh, for globbing on this kind of stuff, but the idea is that when you're building a component, you don't want globbing. You want somebody to just have like a couple of files, uh, and those are, what's, uh, those are what makes up the, the component. If you need globbing, your component is too big. Um, you can list other types of things like styles, you can list fonts, you can li list uh, images, and all those things will go together to build, build up your component. Um, and then you can list your dependencies, and this is where things get cool. Uh, so this guy, uh, he's listed uh, style, inherit, pi, favicon, uh, and auto, auto scale canvas. And basically, well, there's a couple other things you can do with it. And basically wh what you do is uh, when you run component build, it'll take all of, your, all of the dependencies, grab them off GitHub, download them, um, and then concatenate them into a big uh, build.js file. Um, that's cool. Uh, and it, it means that you're able to, yeah, it's very easy to leverage all these little tiny things. Up until now, like, you know, Backbone, for example, requires underscore. Uh, if Backbone had a thousand little pieces that you needed to use as scripts, you just wouldn't pull them in. You'd, you'd, it would suck. So this system allows you to, you know, specify all the stuff that you need um, and you know they can only be they can be this big, and there's very minimal sort of uh, overhead in pulling in all these tiny pieces of code. So what I want to do is just quickly uh, go through this. Oop. Why can't I click on that? Hang on. Oh, there we go. So what I want to do is go through this uh, PyCon library uh, component uh, just quickly. So basically the idea is that I'm sure you saw saw this. It's been on like you know Reddit and stuff probably. Uh, but you know, when you're like, let's say your app's doing something, it updates the uh, the, the fav icon um, with like a you know a pie chart saying it's like loading or whatever. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, but how does he do it? Basically, he's he's using a whole bunch of different little tools to build this awesome little library. Uh, one of them, for example, is this component style library, which uh, allows you to style your canvas elements using uh, plain CSS. Um, so you know, that's all it does. And you, you're, you're free to use that in whatever you want. You can pull that out and you know, it doesn't need to, it's not coupled to the PyCon library. It's completely out on its own. Um, what else have we got? If we go into the, package, the component, JSON. Yeah, so we've got this Py component. The Py component is basically a, uh, I, want to, I can't click on it, but it allows you to draw a canvas um, pie chart. You know, it gives you a very simple API. You just tell it, hey, where is it in the pie chart? The uh, favicon library will allow you to take a canvas and apply it to the favicon. Well, I say it's not even canvas. It's just PNG data. Um, and so you can utilize the you know, canvas to base64, whatever, um, and chuck it up in your, in your thing. So all of these pieces are like useful all on their own. Imagine for a second if jQuery was built like this. 
Imagine if all, the, all of your big libraries were built like this, where all the pieces were u uh, useful on their own. They've got readmes, they've got documentation, um, you know, they've got examples, tests, etc., um, which uh, makes that thing you know, completely self-sufficient. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, if jQuery had some of its traversal stuff you know, away from the Ajax stuff, I hate jQuery Ajax, it's, it's awful. Um, but there's nothing I can do. Whenever I, whenever I want jQuery, I have to pull all of it in. Imagine if the DOM traversal stuff was on its own. Imagine if the jQuery stuff was all on its own. So you, you could, sorry, the Ajax stuff um, was all on its own. So that would allow you to you know, just use that if, if that's all you needed. Um, imagine if the, the conversion from a, uh, like a piece of a string into a DOM element, imagine if that was uh, a thing all on its own. And that's basically what TJ has done here. Um, he's, he's created uh, you know, Domify. He's created, uh, what's it called, uh, classes. All these things which just do one thing, like Domify will take a string and convert it into a DOM element. Classes will take a, uh, a DOM element, just a raw DOM element, doesn't have to be a jQuery DOM element, any DOM element, and it'll apply or remove classes to it. And not only that, its interface is chainable. It's awesome. So, um, yeah, and it's got this auto scale canvas thing. That, that thing um, will automatically detect whether you're running on like a, 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 like a retina display, and it'll automatically scale your canvas up. Uh, so all these things, like I said, they're all useful on their own. Um, so, cool. Uh, there's other systems out there, like Bower, which you may have heard of. Uh, and I think Bower could have been cool, but it's, it doesn't really do much. It's just like git clone, in my opinion. Like, I tried to, I, tried to, I did bower install um, back, uh, bootstrap the other day. What did it give me? It just gave me, like, this, the git repo. What am I going to do with that? Who cares? Why don't I say git clone um, bootstrap? What, what did bower do for me there? It did nothing. Uh, and not only that, it's got its own package management system, which may or may not be down. I, tr I trust uh, the GitHub guys to have their services up. And I, I, that's, I think, one of the, the genius moves that uh, TJ has done here, is he's using GitHub for his infrastructure. But anyway, let's say you're really into Bower, uh, and you're like, all right, well, I, well, one of the problems that Bower does solve is updating your modules, updating your libraries as they change. Um, but you can do that with component as well. There's components for jQuery, there's components for Zepto, there's components for all those other things which I've written, I've written there. The rivets one, this is awesome. The rivets is actually a, um, it's official. Okay, that is the official um, library is now a component for rivets. Who knows what rivets is? Nobody? It's a template library. It's awesome. Uh, Moment.js, also awesome. Um, but the thing is, is that you don't need all these things. You can build up your kind of like jQuery object through a whole bunch of different components. For example, like I said before, there's Domify, which you know, converts a string to a DOM element. There's Classes, which does the thing which I said before. There's DOM, which actually does both. Of, it's kind of like an aggregate thing, which uh, allows you know, adding and removing of that stuff, uh, classes. And it does, it's, like a, it's kind of like jQuery, but without the Ajax. There's Emitter, which is like an event emitter. There's Super Agent, which does the Ajax. So you can pull all these pieces in, which are like small, focused. They do one thing and one thing only. Um, backbone, same sort of thing. You can get all of the backbone pieces through using different components. So page.js is a router. Um, the component model is pretty much the exact same as uh, backbone model, collection, view. Um, you get all of the underscore stuff. So underscore, I really like underscore, but it's got a whole bunch. It's all, again, you have to pull in all this stuff which you may not be using. Um, and basically, component provides that there's a library called enumerable. Um, and I mean, let's click on that. It's such a good library. I love it. Um, it's a mix-in. And basically, you can give it any type, any object, and it, will, um, it allows you to define an enumerable interface on it. So for example, here, let's say like users, who knows what that even is? Like, it could be any type of object. Uh, as long as you define the, where does it say it? Oh, as long as you define like the how to get the next element, you get all this functionality for free, um, and you don't need to use it on a, uh, on an array. You don't need to use it on uh, an object uh, or any particular type. It's just com it uh, allows you to in implement. Where is it? Something down here. It's got. But basically, you implement this function. Where did it go? It's gone. 
doesn't matter. But you implement a function, and uh, one function allows you to get all that functionality on any data type. So that's cool. Let's go back. Oh, cool. Uh, Oh dear. All right. We're good. Good run that battery. Yeah. Cool. That's fine. That's fine. Take it. All right. And so basically, um, one thing which uh, allows you to sort of see how different things work together is uh, that to-do MVC thing. And basically, um, there's a to-do MVC thing for component, uh, which is called component to-do. Um, and uh, there's also a bunch of cool shit. Um, let me just, I'm just showing you some, some components. I'm trying to show you some components. Where is the thing? There we go. I'm only going to show you one, but this one's awesome. Basically, you pull this component in, and it allows you to find the focal point for, a, um, for an image. So let's say you were trying to have a system where you can upload uh, images, and it'll crop them intelligently. Uh, you can load in this component, and it will uh, you know, find where it's sort of the most sensible. I think it does it somehow based on like the amount of detail in the image. Uh, it finds the most detail and then uses that as the focal point. Actually, I'll pull in one more because because it's mine and I like it. Um, this one. So sift. Uh, this is something that I stole. I I did not write this. Um, and but this is part of the beauty of components. It allows you to take code which is otherwise doing nothing. It's sitting like in a in a Stack Overflow. Uh, answer, or it's sitting in some other library, um, and you can extract it out and use it uh, in some other library. So I extract it out. I, I would say that I adopted the SIFT library, um, and basically what it does is here I'll show you. So uh, I built a library which just does, it's kind of like a mapping of like color names to hex codes, and I can type in, for example. Um, uh, for red, for example, that's cool. It's found like the red, but let's say I can't spell red. So like rad. Did you mean red? So basically, that's what that component does. It figures out. Uh, let's say I type something that sounds looks like this. Did I mean Peru? That doesn't look anything like Peru. But hang on. Other ones. Let's type uh, sal mang. Did I mean salmon? So basically, I've pulled this thing out of just some other library. It's called um, MailCheck. And now you can use this piece completely independent of MailCheck. Um, so I, I feel like I've liberated that code. Uh, I've been able to take that thing, get some examples on it, get some tests on it. Um, and now, yeah, it, it's free. So I'm going to have to have a um, And basically, the, the, the point here is that we can open source everything. You don't need to. Um, don't need to keep all of your code inside your, you know, your organization. This is this is something which really bugged me about my life. Uh, was that I was building all, the, I was writing all this stuff, but it just all went internal into the company, and I had nothing to show for it, and that that sucks. Um, so this component thing allows you to very pragmatically um, produce pieces which you can use in your applications, um, you know, open source them, and and it's cool. They only need to be tiny. This is the thing that I found that like a lot of people are like, hey, uh, we don't have time to open source stuff. Uh, it requires too much work. I'm like, what do you mean? It requires too what is that work that they're talking about? They're, it, we're talking about like tests, documentation, all this kind of stuff, which is like actually makes the thing good. So you know, if you can't, if you sort of feel like the code that you're writing isn't open sourceable, it's probably shit. It's shit code. You know. Because it, you know, what else? What else? What other excuse do you have to not open source it, other than maybe exposing a trade secret, which you don't have any, probably. Sorry. Um, so this is the thing I've, I've discovered. I didn't have really many open source repositories until I discovered this component thing, and now I've like made a crap load of like open source uh, libraries, and I feel like I've really grown as a developer because I'm building all these little tiny things. And here's the other point: is I'm not, I shouldn't be allowed anywhere near an application because I'm still not even particularly good at building small, tiny things. You know, how, how am I, author, how am I like, uh, how do I have the stuff to, the skills to build a whole app if I'm not particularly skilled at building a tiny little thing? Um, so this is the, yeah, the cool thing that Component does is allows you to 
you know, build a small, tiny little focus piece of stuff and open source it, put some, put some tests on it, put some documentation on it, make it cool, get feedback. I get, I've never had pull requests before. Actually, I had like one or two. I've had like four in the last week just due to, you know, releasing some components. Pull requests feel real good. I don't mean that's not sus. It does. Uh, like, you know, it makes you feel like, hey, that person's actually like looked at my code. They cared enough to read it. That's a cool feeling. Also, stars, guys, give me stars. I love stars. Stars on GitHub. Um, so, basically, uh, been, uh, this thing's only been around for a while, and I'm, I'm running a test to see how, um, how good it is on this startup that I'm doing called Arata IO. This is a little plug. Uh, I'm doing it with my, my, my friend Sebastian. Um, basically, the idea is that uh, you're, allowed, you're able to take your uh, take a website, dump my script on it, and every time somebody accesses the website, it will hit my server and find if there's any problems with your site, like in terms of like uh, you know grammar problems or typos, etc. It'll pull all the typos and grammar problems down and then um, apply them to the page. So you don't need to worry about like a you know, content management system. You don't need to worry about clearing a cache, et cetera. It's, it's designed for hot fixes when you're like you've launched something. You need to make it change really quickly and your designers away. So I'm building this all with components. And so I'm able to do things like I've got a diff component, which does like a text diff. Again, I stole that. Um, I've got a component which calculates like the CSS path to an element. Um, I pulled that, well, the original implementation, I pulled it out of um, the Firefox code, um, you know, the Firefox, uh, Firebug code. Uh, I've been able to pull out all these awesome stuff, all these awesome stuffs, um, and use them in, in, my, uh, in my thing. And they're all completely self-sufficient. So, Anyway, that's me for components. Um, I'd like you to ask questions. Anybody who asks a question gets a shirt. Here we go. I've got a question here. Over there. Over here. Thanks. Um, I'm actually going to be kind of a jerk because. That's okay. Because um, I've looked at component a bunch. So um, random points. Um, open source done right is really, really important because we've become really good at throwing out whatever we want out there, not maintaining it, not documenting it, and assuming that people just pick it up and keep going. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's been doing using open source for years, um, the amount of libraries that have died or broken in compatibility and so on and so forth has left me maintaining a lot of code in a really annoying way. Um, so it's not fun. Um, B, if you're using like 50 modules written by... So hang on, hang on. Can, we, can, we answer, can I answer that one? Oh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, wh what are you saying there? You're saying that like because you've got open source code that's died, is that bad? Like, I mean, well, how is that better than op uh, just code that's living in your own repository that's died? I'm not, I'm not saying it's... I think bad code should totally die. That's great. Yeah, that's But I think the code. reason that people latch on to things like jQuery or Backbone or whatever other la large library is that they have made a commitment to move forward with everybody else. Um, whereas there's going to be lots of people who will just write something small and never go back to make sure that things are still working, that things are up to date, and so on. And you don't necessarily know that. Like, there's a certain responsibility that you have to take when you put code out publicly that says, hey, you can trust me to use this thing. But and the, okay. I've gone through the effort of making so the, sure the that thing, it's true. The, the thing is, is that, sorry to cut you off. No, it's cool. Uh, but I think the thing is, is that, jQuery and Backbone are going to disappear someday. You know, they're not going to be the, you know, the primary way that people, you know, so for example, you've already got like things like Zepto and all these other MicroJS libraries which are trying to replace them, especially, you know, considering our, you know, the platform that we're deploying on is changing constantly. Um, and, you know, by trust, I'd prefer to trust somebody to write 10 lines of code or, or a page this big um, than I would trust a, some organization to write, you know, two kilometers of code that I have to now, I'm now maintaining. So the idea is that these things are so small that it's trivial to maintain them, even if they don't get maintained. Uh, that's another cool thing about having the namespaces in the component, um, the component JSON. When you're pulling in your dependencies, you can, uh, often I'll find bugs and I'm just like, all right, well, I'm going to fix the bugs, submit a pull request until the pull request gets accepted, if it does. Um, I just run, I just depend on my own um, repository, and it's really simple. So. Um, well, that, that, was, that was one point. Um, the other point about 
if you're using you know, 50 different components written by 30 different people, you're very likely not going to get very consistent code. Uh, people are going to use different uh, you know, syntax styles. Just That's one, one problem. They're going to expect different return values. You might have to start mapping your values from one form to another to use different components and so on. From a maintainability perspective, if you have so few guidelines, you're, you're going to end up resulting in, in having to do lots of transformations and sure. things that don't necessarily make a lot of sense. So hang on. Uh, let me answer that one. Uh, one of the, the things is that that's fine um, as long as the framework that has all the consistency supports the use case that you're talking about. Once you're outside of that, you need to pull in like a plugin or you need to pull in whatever, and it's going to have the exact same problems that you know, you're, you're describing. Um. True. And that last point. I'm sorry. I know I'm totally hogging the mic, but it, this is like a thing I'm, I care about a ton. So, so I I believe truly that open source it can become viable when large companies adopt it and when they start converting, when our Ebays and our PayPal's use open source and it's the best. But the problem is that if you've never worked in a company like that, I have, um, you have to get a lot of permissions to use open source. And uh, as someone who's done it for like 20, 30 libraries at a time for a project, it was like my full-time job for like three months. And when you're starting to really break things up to this to that degree, it becomes um, just not viable. Like the, you know, this may be a great idea, but I would never end up using it in a large company, and so on. And I think we have to find a way to work together uh, in a way that doesn't fragment things so much. But. Cool. No, that's good. good. Thank you. No, oh, um, somebody give her a shot. Okay. Two quick things. Uh, first of all, you could use the Google Closure Library to automatically get rid of the JavaScript functions that you're not using in your code. Yeah. And so you could do it automatically instead of explicitly. And second of all, I would, I would bet you $100 that jQuery continues to be supported and in good shape for longer than you use the component library. OK, well, $100 on that. That's fine. Thank you. It's not really a library. That's the point. It's the opposite of a library. OK. All right. Well, hey, look. Uh, do okay, we, wait, wait, oh, one last one. One more, one more. I've got, give, I've got 20 t-shirts, guys. I've got to give away 20 of these things. So come up and uh, see me afterwards. I mean, it depends about you how hungry you are because there's food waiting outside, right? <laughs> we can go on a bit. So just a quick comment. Um, jQuery is a good way to get into JavaScript because it sort of dumbs down what JavaScript is. It's pretty big, like you're saying. You know, who knows what query selector is? And to say that, you know, query selector wasn't available before IE8 and those, all those kind of things. So my just general question to you is when was the last time you actually used jQuery on a new project? I know you've got a startup going, but like, yeah, yeah. are you using I used, jQuery? I used, like, like I said, up until about a month ago, I'd, that's all I'd used. Uh, and you know, I, like, I like jQuery. It does a lot of stuff for me, but it also abstracts away all of the useful information uh, about the DOM that is useful when I don't have jQuery. You know, and yeah. It, I, I get, the thing, I really like shims. So like if the thing doesn't do what you need it to do, uh, shim it so that it does. So like if, if you need, you know, like there's jQuery.each, um, I'd prefer it to be, hey, let, let's just use normal uh, JavaScript, uh, shim it to uh, shim the ar array uh, prototype to add uh, the for each method. You know, that's a lot better because it's solving the problem where the problem is as opposed to at some other level above which may disappear at some point in the future. Probably. Uh, $100 on it. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys. Big hands for Tim, please. Cool.